Hi, welcome to this time together in worship. This is the last Sunday of the Christian church year. Christ the King is the theme for today. We'll be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll save the last chapter of 1 Thessalonians, a great book for these final days in which we are living, the final days of this world. We'll save chapter 5 for, for a devotion on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, God be with you as you worship today, whether you're sitting by yourself or you've got a, a few other people in your household around you, um, whether you sing nice and loud with, uh, with the music that's linked in the worship guide there, or uh, you just find the, the music on your own and you listen to it, someone else singing it, that's fine. Uh, praise the Lord together with me in this time as we gather around his word. We do so in the name of the only true and triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's say this opening prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you King of kings and Lord of lords to your unending praise and glory. For you live and you reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's take some moments privately to admit our sin to the Lord. Uh, uh, repent is what the Bible calls this. Ad admitting what you have done is wrong when you have broken God's commands and asking for God's mercy to get you out of this, of this trouble. So let's do that using this prayer of repentance. Lord God, I have disobeyed your clear commands. I have no excuse. I am sorry. Please don't treat me as my sins deserve. Show me your mercy instead. Well, friend in Christ, I can assure you that God hears your prayers for mercy, and he loves it when his children bring their, their wrongs to him and ask for help. In fact, he can do better than help. He rescues you. He saves you. And Jesus has forgiven you of all your sins. He did it by taking those sins on himself and paying their penalty. He did that by putting holiness on you, a holiness you couldn't have ever gotten on your own. He did it. He credits you for it. Believe this. This is the good news. You're at peace with God. Amen. You can sing the, the hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, a wonderful way to praise our King, Jesus. Pause me if you'd like to click around and, and sing along with that hymn. Otherwise, let's continue with this statement of faith. It's words pulled right out of the Bible, Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, his love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, his love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance to his servant Israel, his love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. He gives food to every creature, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, his love endures forever. Friends in Christ, let's turn our attention to that, that short letter, 1 Thessalonians, to that fourth chapter. It's uh, printed on the back of your, of your worship guide. If you're following along on, online, you can, you can be using that, or you can open up your Bible to 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, before, we, before we read that, let me read you something that kind of sets the scene. It's the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 27. And this is um, maybe a strange reading to be reading on this. Uh, this isn't Holy Week. This isn't Good Friday. But these are the events that happened on Good Friday. Jesus before Pilate, Pontius Pilate, on trial. He could be begging for his life here. Instead, uh, he, he, he doesn't. He stays quiet. He answers honestly that his kingdom is not of this world. And then Pilate washes his hands and turns Jesus over to be crucified. Our king going to, his, going to his throne. It's a shame 
this is what happened to Jesus, but at the same time, there is nothing better for us that could have happened. Our king takes our place, pays our penalty, and goes to the cross. Listen to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him in the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. What do you make of that? Jesus, your King, in the most famous moment of his life, hanging on a cross that is still depicted all over the place. You draw a cross, but usually it's fancy. Usually it's made of gold or silver or decorative and this is ugly but this is Jesus as our as our king well friends this makes a big difference for how you live makes a difference for how you face death uh, it makes you live like you're not of this world that'll be our our theme today my question for you is what makes the lion the king of the animal world um, you could answer all sorts of things. He's, he's strong, he looks impressive, he's powerful, he's mean, he roars loud. How about a different king? What made Elvis the king of rock and roll? Well, he was kind of a pioneer in it, one of the first. He, he uh, was very successful in, in selling records. He had the attitude and personality of acting like a king. Okay, well, how about a different king? What makes Christ the king? Hmm? What makes Christ your king? Well, uh, all sorts of answers, right? He, he's God. Um, he, he's, he's been through the ringer. He was crucified, died, buried, came back to life. Mm, there's the things he's done for you and for so many other people. In fact, the things that he did for every single person in this world, whether they believe it or not, of paying for all of their sins, of, of caring for them, of acting for them, of loving for them, of becoming a human for them. For you, he's brought you into his kingdom, which he also calls his family, which he also calls his church. There's good reason to call Jesus king. From the perspective of those Roman soldiers that we heard about a minute ago, slugging him with a fist, he didn't seem like a king. From the perspective of those Israelites cheering, cheering for, for Jesus to be crucified, all those families that were stirred up against him, there is nothing kingly about him except that pretend cape and that thorny crown and the sarcastic sign at the top of the cross. He just looked like a weak and dying victim. Yet, from another point of view, with clearer eyes to see Jesus as he really is, what he was really doing there, yeah, that is Jesus being royal. That is as kingly an act as any king has ever done on this earth. No, he wasn't a victim who got caught up by some bad guys. No, he, he was a hero, offering himself on God's altar of justice. That is the most noble thing a king can do, to put your country first, ahead of yourself. And what more could Jesus do to put you ahead of his own comfort? Even now, Jesus runs the world as a king, with all authority over everything, from the atoms that are, are holding your body together, to the number of hairs on your head, to the storms that, 
that, that bring rain, to the stars that shed light, to the number of, of seconds this universe has remaining. King Jesus reigns over all of it. But the area where Jesus exercises the most care in ruling actually has a lot to do with you, actually has a lot to do with you today. The commands that, that Jesus taught to his followers, he told them to tell the next generation and the next generation, and, and they've been passed right on down to you. Those commands are the lifeblood of Jesus' kingdom, his own words, his own promises, his own instructions for us. We look to him, our king, and, and say, what would, you, what would you want of us, Lord? We can lump them into two categories. Jesus teaches us how to live, and Jesus teaches us how to die. Those are instructions for, for, for how to get by until we see Jesus face to face. Thanks to his grace, we, we know where we're, we're headed. And now he teaches us how to live and how to die, too. You could add a third category, too, I suppose. Jesus also teaches us how to live after we die. To hear all of those instructions, we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 4, which takes them in that, in that order. First, how to live as someone who's not of this world in a different kind of kingdom, and then how to die and, and, and look ahead to the life after death, which is totally unlike the kingdom of this world. Well, let's listen. Let's listen to 1 Thessalonians for the first 12 verses we'll look at first. Paul, Silas, and Timothy writing this letter to those Christians in Thessaloniki, Greece. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. There you have it. Here's how to live. As in fact, you are already living. Now we ask you and we urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust, like the pagans who do not know God. And in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you of before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to lead a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about your love for one another, we do not even need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. The Bible doesn't give us any hint, not even in verses like these, <laughs> nowhere in the Bible, that there's any kind of aliens. But Jesus stood, stood before the most powerful person in his, in his continent and said, my kingdom is not of this world. And that person sent him to his death. Jesus was right when he said his kingdom was not of this world. He's right in two ways. First, because he had power but didn't use it in the way that this world expected him to. He had a kingdom, but it wasn't a worldly kind of kingdom. He didn't use power like an earthly king would expect him to. What would we say to him? From an earthly perspective, Jesus, you, what you've got to do as a king is, is feed more groups of 5,000 people. That really works. Or uh, you've got to use your hands to control the wind and the seas, and you could, you could really be in a, a lot of control if you did that all the time. Or start a revolution against a different government. To go to war and you'd always win. Um, make our lives really comfortable and put the people you like in high positions. That's what, how we think. That is of this world. That's what you would do. That's what I would do. That's what everyone in this world thinks like. We'd insist that Jesus would have to act like that if he really is a king. Even, even today, that's what we do. Make me feel better. You gotta, if you've got power, Jesus, you need to do this for me now. And we make earthly demands of our king. Whose kingdom is not really like kingdoms in this world. How dare we do that? How dare we 
expect or tell the king how to act. That's not how citizens in a kingdom treat their king. The second way that those words of Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world, really are, are, are true, is that the world that you see around you, this world here, is not the only world. It's not. It's, it, uh, uh, it's something that you know about, but we don't often talk about it in that way. Um, consider this other world that you are familiar with, where mm, you've, you've got a spiritual world around you at the same exact time as you're living in this world. You know about angels and demons and the characters in there, but uh, sometimes you also <laughs> forget that you are one of the characters in this spiritual world. You have a spirit, a soul, that, it, that exists even though it can't be found under a microscope. Part of you lives in that world and you know it because what is that when guilt is devouring you up and you are afraid of judgment? Uh, it's stuff that you can't see, but it's so true. It's, a, it's like a different world. How about when there is a clock ticking inside you that eventually you're coming to an end and you know there's there's got to be something after it's all done here, isn't there? And what happens there? And how you can't be sure because you haven't talked to somebody who's come back from there. You have no experience there. No one does. And, and, and you think like that. Where is that? That is part of the spiritual world that we live in. Well, into that spiritual world that is kind of confusing, kind of difficult for us to understand, into that world, into your spiritual world, walks somebody who has the answers. Walks someone who can join you in your spiritual world. And that's Jesus. Jesus, your king. He has power in that world to forgive your sin. Yes, sin that angers God and really does stand before him. Jesus cancels. Jesus really was abandoned by his father in a way that nobody on earth could observe or understand. And he really did justify you declare you not guilty of your sins in a true way, even though it'd be hard to, to find a, a record of it or put it under a microscope. Jesus is your king who has power in that world to forgive sin and ease guilt and, and, and fill you with confidence of, about what's coming. And he stays with you no, no matter what. No matter what's happening to your body on the outside or what people are saying or doing to your, 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 your worldly person, You've got a spiritual person that is just fine, that's at peace, and it makes you strange. It makes you strange that you would act like that and that you, you know that there's more to life than what you can observe with your eyes. What, what Jesus left for you, these instructions about how to live, they have less to do with controlling uh, and, and, and ordering you to do this particular action or this particular decision um, that you make. And it has more to do with where are you in, your, in this spiritual world? Where is your heart? Where is your head? Um, what's your attitude toward that other person? Where do you want to see that person end up eternally? What's your motivation in making this decision? Would it please God? Um, how, how will that affect your reputation? If you go ahead and do this, how will that affect your reputation with people who don't know about Jesus yet? Boy, those are all spiritual uh, bits of guidance from Jesus that affect how you live. You and I really do live in a kingdom that's not of this world. And we also have a totally foreign, not of this world, alien way of thinking and dealing with death and dying. So the Thessal Thessalonian Christians they first received this letter and they were on the right track in a lot of ways. They were, they were fascinated with this promise that they hadn't heard about in their Greek culture that Jesus would come back and he would take him to be with them. They couldn't understand it and they had a lot of questions, but they believed it. It made them a little concerned though, a bit confused. Um, on the one hand, some people just quit their jobs. And they started kind of acting lazy, just waiting for Jesus to come back because that was the promise, right? 
Maybe I'll just hang out here at church and just wait. Uh, that wasn't that wasn't right. So they got a bit of a slap of the wrist at the end of that of that last uh, section of verses that we just read. Maybe you catch that now. Um, get to work. <laughs> Go do something useful with your hands. And Jesus decides the time is right. He'll come back. You won't miss it. Just work. Do something useful. Others in the group were were just very concerned that people in the church were were starting to die. And they hadn't had many funerals, in <laughs> Christian funerals at all up to this point. And uh, they, were, they were just wondering, eh, when Jesus comes back, some Christians are going to be dead. And some of us might still be alive. Uh, is that okay? <laughs> what about that? Is one of them better or worse? Does somebody get left out? Those are the kinds of questions on their minds. And that's what gets answered in these next sections of section of verses here, starting at verse 13 through the end of the chapter. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, for, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That is encouraging to be reminded of these or of these things, of what will happen on that last day. It simplifies things, for me at least. You know, I've got my lifetime, and when God decides it's time for me to fall asleep, I do. And then I wake up. I'm asleep, and then I wake up. I get that. And there's also a final day that Jesus has promised. And maybe I'll be alive when that day comes, maybe not. But God's got it all planned out, the order, exactly what's going to happen on that day so that no one's forgotten, whether you're still walking around or whether your body's been buried. No Christian gets left behind. We just follow our king wherever he leads us. Whatever his timing and plans are for us, we follow our king. It makes it super easy. Because what happened with Jesus, our king? He died, then he rose. He died, he came back to life. That's, it's as simple as that. If I die, I'll come back to life. If you die, you come back to life. And we'll be with our king forever. Super simple. Uh, children understand this. I die and go to heaven. It's, it's possible to grasp that without making it very complicated. If this were your first time hearing this, of course you'd say, well, that is very strange. How, what, a, what an interesting belief. Let, I'd like to hear more about that because, it, oh man, that is different than how I was raised. That's different how I think about life. Um, but they would admit this is simple. <laughs> you die, you come back to life. And we'd agree this is simple, that our future is not in this world. Because that's the, the whole second half of our eternal life is yet to come. And it's going to be a lot better than this half of our eternal life. The last time that my family flew, um, our plane was delayed because they had a mechanical issue with the, the incoming plane the, before it took off. So we had to just wait until that one got here. Um, but they, they couldn't fix it, so they just switched planes. And it only took them an hour, but uh, an hour delay, and, and then we got on this other plane that had, had flown successfully to come and pick us up. And the flight attendant came over the speaker while we were boarding and kind of apologized for the, the delay and explained, oh, there was a problem with that plane, so we got you a better plane. <laughs> That's putting it in the best possible way. There's a problem there, so we got you a better one. Uh, Jesus is preparing a better place for you. He's got instructions for you while you live in this life, rough as it might be. He's got guidance for you as you live here, but it's not the be-all and end-all, your life here. Invisible as Jesus is, as tough as your situation might be, as powerless as you or God might seem, from an outside perspective, remember that he is the one who's still calling the shots here. He's still got everything in his hands, including you, 
including this day, this week, this year. He'll get you through here. He'll get you through this life. But your king also has bigger and something better planned for you. He's got a better life for you. Living or dying, young or old, comfortable or not so comfortable, King Jesus holds your hand. He holds the victory. And he holds you in his kingdom, whether living or dying. You're in his kingdom, which is totally not of this world. Amen. Let's say a prayer, a special prayer for this day. Most high and honorable King, we praise you alone. You descended to our side in full sight of the people who rebelled against you. You bore our sufferings. You carried our sins on your holy shoulders. You crossed from life to death and then back to life, all on your own terms, in your own time, and under your own power. You've taken an interest in my life and my future, and you've called me to follow you on this journey. And now it seems as though this life is the exile and heaven is our home. Instruct me to walk each day, each step, each decision, in ways that make you happy and lift you up. When it's your time to end my, my life uh, here on earth, give me faith to sleep. And then speak to me like you did when you told the daughter of Jairus, little girl, get up. Talk to me like that and call us from our graves. We ask for your forgiveness for failing to see your power when you choose not to act in our time or in our way. Increase our faith by your strong spirit so that we trust your decisions, which are as high above our heads as the heavens are above the earth. Hear these prayers of your people, Lord. Come quickly and answer, rescue, heal, and take us home. In your almighty name, amen. And hear us as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Feel free to close with this uh, Thanksgiving hymn. You can give offerings of thanks to the address that's listed in your worship guide. If you're not able to, to be in person this weekend, uh, that's, you know, we're, we'll miss you, but um, we understand. There is a, a little fellowship uh, meal, Thanksgiving style meal that those of us in person will, will enjoy. Um, so say a prayer for that, that fellowship and that unity there that we enjoy. But we're glad for, for you too as part of this family of faith. A reminder that there's not in-person worship on Thanksgiving Day. Instead, you'll receive an online video devotion like this, plus an activity and prayer sheet that you can use at your own Thanksgiving table around your, around your Thanksgiving dinner, if that's how you choose to use it. Um, it's designed for you to be used in home and kind of guide your prayers of thanks on that special day. Until next time, God go with you, keep you safe, keep you close to him. Bye.